You see, what always happens is that the people who are the victims are the most caring, the most careful, the most perfectionist. And because they're perfectionists, they do, for instance, a very, very long warm-up. They, they take forever to get themselves without trying, without just letting the body work, just letting it sort of... Whereas I never had time for warm-ups. Perhaps I, I fell into that. I, you know, I was never quite happy and I would, I would practice regularly and try and improve my playing. It could hit a certain personality type. Those people who expect very high standards of themselves, a slight perfectionist approach, whereas someone who's, who, who doesn't care so much, I say, oh, well, I split a note, doesn't matter. Um, might not affect those people so much. There seems to be um, a high percentage of people on low brass instruments getting this, which I don't really don't know why. Trombone, bass trombone, tuba players, maybe less so, although, although it's not entirely, it does affect some horn players, and I know a, a trumpet player who, who suffers, but it seems to be more in the low brass area. And I, I really don't know why, why that is, really. My colleagues in the orchestra were extremely supportive and, and probably at that time, early on, it wasn't really noticeable to anyone. And so when I talked to my colleagues, I said, oh, I'm having problems with this, they probably said, oh, they said, don't worry about it, and um, it sounds fine to us. But I, I, knew, I knew something was wrong. The natural instinct is to think, oh, you're doing something silly, you, 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 you're, you're, it's bad technique or something, you, you're doing something incorrect. Um, and so you perhaps start then trying to analyse the, the playing because the natural way of playing seemed to have got somewhat lost a little bit. So maybe you start then focusing in a little bit too much on, what the, on the physical side of it, just in an attempt to kind of rectify the situation. But I think that, in a way, perhaps makes matters worse because it, you, you, a part of your, your brain is, or part of your mind is... is be, is on the physical process rather than on the purely musical outcome at the end of that process. And I think that could be part of the reason why there's a, a bit of a downward spiral. And it, that's what it definitely felt like. And I, I managed to stay, I was with the LSO trying to, over, trying to um, overcome this difficulty for about 18 months but it it was becoming an increasingly more frustrating business really because um just uh, because pieces that i'd never had problems with were, were giving me severe difficulties and then it reached the point i think at about mid mid oh, summer 2003 where i thought this i must stop now and, and take time off before it was really really noticeable to to the audience even and it's not only brass players who suffer with focal dystonia. Piano players, string players, guitar players can get the same condition in their hands. Um, so, and and it, it's the weirdest thing that you might find a pianist, maybe the, the, the fingers in the right hand are more affected because that's where more of the, the attention, mental attention is. Um, in string players, the, it, they might be affected more in the left hand where they're putting the fingers down on the fingerboard. And there are very weird characteristics to it where it's different from one person to another. Um, some pianists seem to be able to play on ivory keys where it wouldn't affect them. Playing on plastic keys would cause the hand to cramp up. Maybe their the hand would go into a claw or, or the fingers would go into funny sort of spasms. Um, one finger wouldn't quite do what it's told. Um, when it comes to brass playing, you hear all sorts of people who can't play in the low register, but they can play in the high register, or vice versa. There's a, a very famous tuba player in New York who could play nice um, flowing melodies, nice legato melodies, but he couldn't go boom, 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 boom. He couldn't be uh, precise when he brought this sort of articulation in. And this is what the, the strange... Um, little in idiosyncrasies of, of the whole thing is and it seems to be slightly different from one person to another. But is this a new phenomenon? If you look back historically there are loads of players that suddenly can't play, you know, the chops have gone um, and you, you know, your next minute you know, they're, sort of, you know they're running a pub or driving a taxi or whatever they're doing um, pr the chances are that it's very probable that all of those players we're suffering from this thing we now know as focal dystonia. The first, curiously enough, 
was Eric Pritchard, who was second trumpet with Ernest Hall in the BBC Symphony Orchestra in about 1936. And he became a timpanist. Several of them were my students. Peter Game was one of them. John Pritchard, who was bass trombone of the London Philharmonic, he was there for eight years, and he found that he couldn't start notes, he, he, he froze. It affects people in various different ways, but the, the ultimate reason is the same. Mark Eager, who was the first trombone of the BBC National Orchestra of Wales, had this happen to him yeah. as a result of overstrain. And I felt terribly guilty about this because it was a piece that I'd, I'd suggested that uh, Alan Hodenot wrote for him. A, a new trombone concerto, which uh, and Mark was still pushing the boundaries, making it more and more strenuous, which he did. And uh, eventually, he did the first two performances of it, and virtually never played again. It almost came back, and he was in a car crash. He, it was coming back. He was in a car crash, which didn't affect him um, physically. physically. Uh, he stepped out of the wreck, which was a miracle in itself. But it it had come back completely, and he couldn't make sound. So let's see what help was available. I then seriously started going to see, um, you know, top players, top teachers, who who I thought, well, they, they might be able to help me. Um, to, to mention a few names, I, I went to see Dennis Wick, um, Eric Cree, Simon Wills, as well as my colleagues, Jim Maynard, Dudley Bright, Patrick Harold in the orchestra. And I think they were all a bit mystified because... Really, I seemed to be doing everything correctly, and the embouchure really looked fine. Um, but there, there was something severely wrong, and, it, and what it, it did feel like that the natural muscular memory had been lost. He came to see me because I'd done so much teaching to see if I could help him, and to my, my embarrassment, I couldn't. A few weeks later, we had an ITA subcommittee meeting with Jan Kagerice, mm -hmm. uh, married to Vern Kagerice. Well, Jan has, uh, she's still doing a lot of clinical therapy, which is basically getting people to start playing again as though they'd never played before, which means that you have to start as a 10 year old. Yeah. Uh, I managed to get um, Bob Hughes around to the house when the Kagarises were both staying here, and Jan spent four hours working with them in the music room. And in the end, he could make a sound, which he couldn't before. I went over to America about five times to visit her and she, she came over to the UK once or twice and she was um, very, very, um, very, very helpful, very kind and understanding and I did make some improvement. Um, a lot of what we did was trying to really get, get the mind off the, what the, physical, the physical side of everything, get your mental attention from that focus on a nice relaxed airstream and f concentrating on what the, the product you want coming out of the bell. And um, we, to some extent that worked and, and I did make some progress. Um, actually there was one day I think where it, um, it came back rather well. And I, I, you, you naturally think, well, great, I've, it's come back, fantastic. Then the next day I couldn't play at all.